So tonight we're talking about the Métis question in Eastern Canada, and we are going to attempt to the extent that time allows to debunk some of the myths about the existence of Métis and other Aboriginal rights-bearing communities in Nova Scotia today. Um, I have with me Professor Sebastian Millet. Uh, just a little quick bio. He is a professor of indigeneity and law at Carleton University in the Department of Law and Legal Studies. He earned a political science degree at the University of Victoria and then did a postdoctorate degree at the University of Melbourne. His postdoctorate was in university relations. And uh, Dr. Millet, or Professor Millet, or Dr. Millet? Dr. Millet is, um, is an expert in the subject area of the French Acadian Metis in Nova Scotia or in the Maritimes in general. So that's why I've invited him to come and speak here tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about some broader concepts first to just kind of put things in context and to maybe encourage people to think about these issues in a non-legal or a less legal and limited way um, because I think often we get trapped in that dialogue without a real understanding of the history or the cultural context and I think that that's quite important as lawyers and as future lawyers or members of the community if we're going to have a discussion about this I think that we should really have a, a more fulsome understanding of what it is that we're talking about. So um, I'm going to just do a few minutes maybe 15 or so and then I'm going to turn it over to Professor Millette to educate you specifically on Acadian Métis culture. Um, but before I start, I would like to acknowledge that we are on unceded Mi'kmaq territory as part of the territory of the Wabanaki Confederacy. So we'd like to honor that. Um, the main point of tonight's discussion, the main focus of the discussion, is the concept of Aboriginal identity and treaty rights. Specifically, the population of the maritime provinces who are as yet unrecognized as being members of that rights-bearing Aboriginal population. Um, we recognize that there may be some rather strong and conflicting opinions on the subject matter, either for or against the concepts that are being presented here this evening. But I would like to emphasize that Professor Millet and I have discussed this and, and we are endeavoring to discuss this in a very conciliatory manner so that we, we seek not to offend or exclude anyone or their identities, but rather to make this a more inclusive discussion. Um, because we are trying to present in a conciliatory manner, in a manner and of, because of course we are doing this in a professional context in an academic setting, we ask that everyone's comments or questions be delivered in a respectful manner, whether or not you agree with what we're saying, and that you show respect for the views of others as well. So, just to start, on the topic of identity. I think that we could agree, um, not just in this area, but generally, that identity is a fluid concept and it's unique to each individual and each community um, whether or not that concept is shared by others right it's come apparent however through the course of public dialogue and litigation that the concept of aboriginal identity is very very contentious and controversial and that there is discord not only between the general public's perception of what ab Aboriginal identity is and that of Aboriginal people, but even between communities of Aboriginal people. So that's the purpose of this conversation this, this evening, is to try to address some of those differences of opinion and come to a greater understanding of what that means. As of right now, and since the coming into force of Section 35 of the Constitution of Canada 1982, there are three categories of Aboriginal identity to which one can ascribe. Those are status, non-status, and Métis. 
Status and non-status Aboriginal identities are the byproduct of categorizations of entitlements created under the Indian Act by European legislators, legislators who clearly lacked an understanding or concern for how Aboriginal people have traditionally identified themselves and with each other. The Métis are viewed as a people who have a combination of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, usually European, ancestry and are the only constitutionally protected Aboriginal population who have a right of self-identification. However, it's that very right of self-identification that gives rise to the controversy over who the Métis are and what rights they have and what right they have to self-identify as such. Which is interesting to me, and, and Professor Millet and I were having this conversation in my office earlier, that the Métis, or people who identify themselves as Métis, are the only population of mixed ancestry, or mixed an ethnicity or culture, however you choose to, to define that, that have to justify their existence. For example, about three and a half years ago, I had spoken in Senate at the, legal, the Senate committee hearings into the legal and political rights of the Métis. And as I explained to them at that time, you know, if I were Irish and English or Dutch and French or, you know, German and Polish, I could go into either community, be completely accepted as a member of that community, embrace either aspect of my identity and culture, and I would never be challenged on that. It's the issue of aboriginality and what that means in terms of rights or potential rights that seems to create the conflict and the controversy. In fact, Canada, under our Constitution, is the only country that creates the separate category. So for example, there are mixed blood populations all over the world. Um, even in my ancestral territory of Massachusetts and the surrounding area. But there is no separate category for people who are of mixed ancestry. So this, this is something that's unique to Canada. And as Professor Millet's going to expand on later, it's because of uniquely Canadian history and how that term evolved and where it evolved. Um, traditionally, and this goes back to what I was just saying about this being the only place, community acceptance and community membership was determined by the community itself. It wasn't determined by legislation or by treaties or by policies or anything else. And this, this categorization of identity through Eurocentric instruments who lack an understanding of Aboriginal culture is exactly the problem. That's, in my opinion, the, the genesis of the problem right there. Um, traditionally, one was either a member of an Aboriginal community by marriage, birth, adoption, or their presence. So in the traditional Aboriginal concept of community, if you were accepted as a member of that community, it didn't matter how you became a member of that community, you just were. And that underscores my point that the distinctions in Aboriginal identities have been created by Eurocentric legislation and policies and not by Aboriginal people themselves. And therefore, those categorizations are arbitrary and discriminatory that don't honor our traditional concepts of our own identities and our communities and community membership. The fact remains, though, that the treaties that were made across North America between Europeans and Aboriginal people included all members of those communities. It didn't matter what blood quantum they had, how they became a member of the community, who they married, who they didn't marry if they lived, you know, within the boundaries of the community or outside the boundaries of the community, it didn't matter. If they were accepted as members of the community, then they just were. And the treaties encompassed all of those people who were living within the territories that the treaties covered. 
and didn't matter if they were mixed blood or not. In fact, there's historical evidence to prove that many signatories to those early treaties were of mixed blood and that many of the chiefs who signed those treaties, because not all signatories were chiefs, right? Sometimes they were delegates or they were just respected community members who could go. But the point is that there's evidence that there were some mixed blood people, whether chiefs or delegates, who did sign those early treaties. And we have examples of that right here in Nova Scotia. So I'm following my notes because I could literally write a book on this and if I don't stick to the notes, I'm going to go on for five hours, so I don't want to do that. Um, the only difference for the purpose of Aboriginal and treaty rights is whether or not they are recognized by government and by members of the larger Aboriginal community as being members of the Aboriginal community because we've come so far from how we conceive of that. We're so far off of our traditional concept of who is one of us and who isn't, and who's okay and who's not. So the thing is about treaties is that they're agreements between independent nations that regulate relationships between the leaders and the citizenry of those nations. And sometimes, and in particular more so in the numbered treaties that, you know, out west, um, it was about the use or the interest in a particular parcel of land. You know, because in, in the West, the script system was in the West where you would trade your aboriginality for some type of compensation and therefore give up your rights to the land and your rights to your identity and otherwise. That didn't exist here. But nations, whether under treaty or not, and in particular under treaty, do not normally presume to control one another or the rights of the citizenry or certain aspects of their existence unless those rights are specifically ceded. And it's a well-established principle of Aboriginal law that treaty rights cannot be extinguished unless they are, unless it is expressly done through a future treaty or some type of a legislative instrument or unless they are ceded by the Aboriginal people themselves. And in Canada, and in this area in particular, that has never happened. That is absolutely not the case. It's clear from the early treaties that our rights to harvest, engage in trade, or use and move freely on the land have also never been extinguished or ceded. Yet over the years, the predecessors of the current colonial government, I'm speaking more specifically to the federal government, but also provincial governments, have sought to quantify, monetize, limit, or otherwise eliminate the rights of Aboriginal people along with their identities. And these interferences have been justified with reliance on the assumption of European control. However, just to give you, a, I guess, uh, an anecdote. I walk into your home. I just arrive one day, completely unexpectedly. And I say, okay, this is a nice place you've got here. I think that I'm just going to make this my house. And from now on, you're going to do everything my way. It didn't work then. It doesn't work now. Right? The Aboriginal people, we never, we never seated control of our identities, of our lands, of our resources. It was an assumption based on a normalized Eurocentric standard of colonization. I think we can all agree that control is not established by just establishing a presence in a particular place. And I would argue that Aboriginal people have never agreed to it either. And that's why there's been so much litigation. That's why there was so much conflict over the years. That's why there was never a law in place, if you look history, and I've looked, to see what were the laws of the early colonial governments in Nova Scotia, 
and even as far down as the Massachusetts province, which is more relevant to me um, for my particular ancestry. But there were no laws in place to control Aboriginal people or their rights or their resources back then. The only law, the only system of law that was in place was European law to regulate the citizenry of the European state. They did not apply to Aboriginal people or their activities until much, much, much later on. And I would argue that the first clear example of that would have been the Indian Act in 1876. I mean, there were, you know, the famous scalping laws and things like that, but that had nothing to do with rights. Furthermore, the treaties of the maritime region are very, very different, as I alluded to earlier, than the treaties in other areas of Canada and the United States. The treaties of the maritime region covered the entire eastern seaboard from just north of what's modern-day Florida all the way up into the Gas Bay region. So the Treaties of Peace and Friendship in 1725 actually was first signed at Boston in December of 1725 and then later ratified by the Mi'kmaq and the colonial government in Halifax in 1726. So everyone, every nation between, and by nation I mean Aboriginal nation, okay, because they were otherwise referred to as British colonies, every Aboriginal nation from north of Florida to Gatsby Z was encompassed in those territories. Those treaties were meant to confer protection and rights upon all the members of those nations and their ancestors for future generations forevermore. And therefore, it is my view, and I don't think it's just my view, but I'm speaking, so it's my view, that every person who is a descendant of the beneficiaries of those early treaties by virtue of ancestry is also a beneficiary of those early treaties and the rights that were contained therein. Also importantly, nowhere in those treaties do the English expressly uh, claim control over Aboriginal people or their lands or their rights. They were reciprocal treaties in a sense of mutual um, trade and settlement and to, you know, end conflict. Now clearly that didn't work very well because the conflict went on well into the 1700s and the treaties had to be ratified again in 1749, 1752, 1760, and 1761. Part of that, for the, in the purpose of Nova Scotia, or for, for the area of Nova Scotia, was because of conflict between the English and the French, and the alliance, the historical alliance, of the Mi'kmaq with the French people who were here, which, of course, led to um, mixed blood children, right? Very well documented. The fur trade started here. There were relationships between the French and the Aboriginal people. The first such recorded birth was in the early 1600s, actually. And I was the De La Torre family. Yes? Yes, in the area of Cape Sable Island. I don't remember all the historical facts all the time. So, um, the first such birth in recorded birth in the Massachusetts province was actually around the same time. Now, I'm emphasizing the fact that it's recorded because things weren't recorded until the European settlements and the European settlers became entrenched in these territories. Until they had people who were capable of reading and writing and had an interest in documenting things because Aboriginal language and Aboriginal knowledge is passed on with symbols and with stories. We didn't document things. So that's not to say that a hundred years earlier there might not have been mixed with children. I'm saying that the first ones that we know of were in the early 1600s. 
and they were because of more intimate relationships between settlers and Aboriginal people. However, the relationship between Aboriginal people and Europeans, and I would suggest the blending of the culture of Europeans and Aboriginal people would have started with those early trade relationships, just by virtue of the fact that the Europeans were passing on pots and, and, and knives and other implements that were used in European society to the Aboriginal people in exchange for the furs and things like that that the Europeans were taking back to their communities. So already we have a mixing of the implements and the, the trappings of each other's cultures going back and forth, right? So when we argue that, you know, there has to be a historical demonstrated blending of the cultures and specific identities and specific this and specific that, that started a long time ago. That started as soon as the first boats hit the shores, whether or not there were settlements, in my opinion. Um, so it's also reasonable to conclude, if that, be, that being the case, then it's also reasonable to conclude, and I think that there's demonstrated evidence of such, that the children of those bicultural relationships would have adopted aspects of both cultures and therefore developed their own culture. Now, there's been some talk that certain communities um, that are not here coined the term Métis and that theirs is the only true culture. Not so. Cultures arise, and it doesn't matter if it's Aboriginal culture, Métis culture, English culture, it doesn't matter. Culture arises at a specific point in time in a specific place under certain sets of cir circumstances. And then there are all kinds of social and political and historical factors, climate, the accessibility to resources, the nature of the resources that will shape that culture and how that culture develops. And in fact, the term Métis, and I'm not gonna get too far into this because this is Sebastian's um, area of expertise, but, it's also documented that the term Métis or Métissage was first used in Nova Scotia by a Jesuit priest who was baptizing the child of an Aboriginal woman and a French man. So for anyone to say, and, and knowing that the fur trade started here and then the Cœur de Bois went that way, for anyone to say that the term Métis could not be appropriately used by the people of anyone outside of Manitoba, and in particular the Red River Valley, is absolutely historically inaccurate. Uh, okay, so I flipped all over the place here. Um, I'm going to turn it over in a minute, but my point, my point is this, and the, and the reason that I'm saying the things that I'm saying is because I think that, in my view, one of the, th one of the most harmful things that we can do as Aboriginal people is to try to exclude each other and try to deny each other's culture. There has been a long history of that um, by virtue of the actions of European centralized government and institutions, beginning with the categorizations in the Indian Act of status, non-status, and more recently, Métis the residential school system, the reservation system. I mean, we could go on and on and on and on and on about the denial of identities and the denial of cultures and the discrimination that's existed against Aboriginal people. I don't think, and my message here today, is that I don't think that it serves us as Aboriginal people to perpetuate that conflict against 
each other because while we are focused on the divisive categorizations that have been created by the European governments and legislations and policies, we cannot focus on empowering ourselves and each other as people. And I don't think that we're serving our own interests by putting our focus on the negative. Okay, so and that's my message. So Sebastian's gonna do his thing a little more academically. <laughs> Okay, well thank you for that uh, introduction and uh, that talk. Uh, it looks like a gift. I will know it later, I'm assuming, but it's already looked like a gift. Um, I'm really pleased to be here for, uh, for the first time. Thank you so much and I also acknowledge um, that we are on Mi'kmaq land and uh, I've called home to the community and I said to, uh, to the client mother there, so what should I say when I'm going to get to Nova Scotia and that territory? And they tell me, well, the Wabanaki Confederacy is pretty old and it's pretty safe to say that um, they should be acknowledged and honored, but also make sure to salute our uh, Ike and Miti cousins down there with their presence and their ongoing fight, and I'd like to acknowledge that right off the bat. Um, so today I've created a Prizzy presentation and I'm going to try to go at this. Usually I like to go orally at this and really be at ease with the material. But because of the lecture today, I wanted to bring like primary evidence and some documents that will exemplify the points that I'm trying to bring across in terms of Miti identity in the eastern part of Canada. So I've created this template from you, uh, and, uh, and just, uh, just I'm, I'm speaking French, so sometimes I may look for my words a little bit, right? Um, from the get-go, I would like to say that I'm not here on record to say that the Red River Métis are not entitled to their nation, form of politics, inclusion, exclusion, or whatnot. I'm here to suggest another thought, to say that the term Métis, actually, needs further precision. It's not just Red River Métis. I'm from Great Lake Métis community, from Ontario, the southern tip of what they used to call the Middle West in the Fur Trade Triangle between Montreal, Detroit, Kaskaskia, and Mayette Town, which was after my last name, Mayette or Mallette destroyed by the Michigan militia uh, uh, in the context of the, the 1812 war and the aftermath. Completely destroyed. All the houses burned. Something familiar with the Acadian experience. Community were destroyed. People were killed. Women were dishonored, according to the term. And children often enslaved. So we can connect through our common experience, common language, common aspects of what we went through in terms of what certain people coin now in terms of mixed ancestry, heritage, or whatnot. And we're going to get to the bottom of this. So I'm not here to discredit Red River Métis Nation. And actually, I got a lot of friends in Red River in St. Boniface. And on camera as well, I would like to salute Elder Paul de Rosier and Dolores Goslin from L'Union Nationale, Métis Saint-Joseph, the society that was created in 1884 by Riel, and after his execution, by his brother. I go there, I often visit the, these communities, or, you know, brothers and sisters, and having a lot of fun, okay? But I also visit other communities across Canada, including in the Supreme Court while we're waiting, you know, for sometimes decision or whatnot, we, we, we blend with each other, right? And people from northern Saskatchewan, from the Métis settlement, from different places in Canada, all have their different identities, their own spin at things, their own politics, their own conflicts, their own vision, and it has evolved. When I was sitting in the, in the Supreme Court for, uh, for the Daniels case before they went into decision that we're now waiting, I saw a great diversity of Métis people there. 
a very great diversity. But now the language is hardening by some key actors, especially in the academy. And my own experience has been of such as well. I did my PhD at the University of Victoria. So coming out of that PhD, I think some assumed that I was a Western Métis. Well, in fact, I was more a central or whatnot Métis. And so they tell me, oh, great, a new, you know, a new PhD warriors in line, something like that. And I was I introduced for the very first time a bit of, of that more advocacy line that these guys are not Métis, we're the real one Métis. And that just conflicted with the teaching of my dad and with everything that I knew from my experience with other uh, First Nations and Aboriginal Indigenous people, right? And it shocked me in terms of the arguments of nationalisms that I heard, of like really hardcore form of exclusion, inclusion, built on an homogenic understanding, essentializing almost understanding of Miti culture. I was like, what is this? What is this about? Why do we need this? Where I came from, I thought that we were, and I still believe that at the bottom of my heart, a relational people. See, at the bottom of the argument that I'm going to get today, it's that there's an academic actor out there that wrote a book about me, T, right? To name it, in 2014, Dr. Chris Anderson. And we're going to review his argument in a second, but just as a teaser, Dr. Chris Anderson suggests that if you're outside a certain form of nationalistic ethnogenesis happening in the valley of Red River, if you're outside of that emergent crystallization of a collective consciousness, you're not a Métis. And if you claim you are a Métis, you're, rationali you, you, you're like kind of making a, a racist statement about Métis identity. You think of Métis identity in terms of mixed race. And I think, if I'm reading him correctly, that this is really bad. You don't want to get there. You don't, you ever don't, you know, you don't, you don't want to have this racial, racist label on your back. So you got to move away from those racial categories of mixed people and whatnot that has like kill the Miti Nation spirit in and of itself by bringing them down to just a mix, half-breed, or whatnot, residual, something aboriginal, to something nationalistically pure and intact and strong. So is the language. Well, I want to challenge that to the core by showing you evidence today in Louis Riel's writing, among other things, but also in other actors, that tells you that the valuation of mixed heritage, per se, is what characterizes Métis culture. Or at the very least, it can be one of the multiple interpretations of Métis identity. You may value your Aboriginal ancestry and your European ancestry coming together to create that beautiful, unique culture and a way of expressing itself according to ecological modulations and different circumstances in time. I will suggest, what is wrong with that? It's not about being racist, it's about understanding that people are not about quantum, but they're about relationship. And I truly hope that at the end of the day, Chris Anderson, Adam Goodries, other actors that you know we've been playing ball with one another since a while now, we're going to come to a common understanding that we may agree to disagree on this, but still, we're about relationships. We're, we're about, you know, I would hope, kinships, location, celebration of differences, inclusivity, and the possibility to survive for a more challenge according to the leg legislation and the legal and framing that we're still enduring to this day. So far, am I clear? Or am I off the rail already? It's clear? Okay. So I've created a bunch of circle for you guys that you're going to see on screen now. Not, don't be scared. These are just backup evidence. Yeah, I, I, came, I came loaded, right? Uh, <laughs> but I'm not going to use them all, obviously. But if we need to go into further discussion, I can have in my back pocket some interesting stuff that I may share with you, OK? But just some of the objectives. I have three main objectives today, as I'm, I am truly hopeful that we're going to do this. I'm going to offer an early description of what may be Acadian Métis. 
I'm going to interrogate why new tensions around the word Métis. It's no secret that my conference and my presence here echoes a conference not long ago, I think here too, in that institution? It's at the it's, it was at the library, right, where, where uh, uh, Dr. Adam Godry did a, did a talk and, and suggested that uh, Eastern Métis or Acadian Métis were wrong, essentially. I don't want to misquote him. I was not at his conference. I didn't read his conference. But I think it's fair to assume that he suggested that uh, the people that are Acadian Métis are actually in the wrong and are deluding themselves by using the term Métis. And that they're not only deluding themselves, hence in a, in a form of double ignorance, they are actually hijacking the identity of another person, right? And hence they are guilty of the ultimate sin there is out there in native study of cultural appropriations. I mean, you don't want to get there either, right? There's two labels you don't want to have on your back. Racist and cultural appropriator. That is like anathema, right? It's like, ugh, really bad. You smell bad forever with those things. Don't worry, you may survive them. I've been cast those labels all over myself and my community for now two years because I'm producing what I'm speaking to you today has been targeted by a number of key actors, including online, that weren't just like, well, Sebastian, because you're saying so, you're an appropriator, you're a white Métis, you're a fake Métis, you're an ancestor, we're a rapist, and whatnot. I heard them all, right? So I managed to survive to present this to you today, hopefully, with a smile. So don't despair if you get ever caught into those crossfire. They're not as bad as they look, okay? <laughs> that being said. So, and the last point that I want to discuss, if I can make it there, it's a legal point for the legalistic people among the crowd about the possibility of uh, hammering down the need for liberal interpretation if we go to Pauli criteria, okay? So uh, the conference uh, was, um, was publicized in a newspaper, the Adam Goodrich conferences about, uh, you know, his claim that uh, Michi in the East never existed and, you know, uh, basically, I'm just going to take one quote here. Godry, from, this is from the article, said that they are a group in eastern Canada, and I quote, that are only just emerging, and these organizations should not be describing themselves as Métis, and a quote. So I'm just going to take that and perhaps another quote from the article to run with it, right? I mean, Dr. Godry can defend himself after that, I believe, saying he never said so in such a way. That, that's fair, but just for the sake of creating a problem in a conversation. And I will argue a further point is that his line was, uh, in fact, you know, all his argument can be fine encapsulated in the book Me T by Chris Anderson, Dr. Chris Anderson, University of Alberta, which you can read and have like, you know, a 200 explanation page on, on this argument. But for sake of expediency today, I've kind of fleshed out that book as a primer of our conversation in four points. Okay, so uh, if some people are interested about that, um, that PowerPoint presentation or that Prizi, you email me after, you can reach me, okay, I will, you know, okay. So I, I'm, I'm aware that you guys cannot read all of that material and you're like, are you crazy, Sebastian? It's after six, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> basically, doc, uh, Dr. Chris Anderson suggests in his book that Raising out of historical struggles out in Red River, there were the emergence of some collective memories that have been created, right? We can read in history books that there has been a number of memories collected, okay? These memories collected, the second point say, give rise to a collective consciousness, a meaty peoplehood. And I'm putting, you know, a, a, a quote after, like, documented, please, because we need hard evidence that this historical events did take place. We need history books. We need narrative that tells so. And I'm going to get to this point further. The rise of collective consciousness of meaty peoplehood is out of those, those, those social events that create the context of a social consciousness. And the term Miti should be attached to that collective consciousness. Alone, exclusively, right? 
outside of that collective consciousness, that moment by which Métis from mixed blood or merely mixed blood becomes a subject of nationalisms, emerge only at Red River, according to the argument. Outside of that, your ancestor might have been half blood or half caste or Jakatars or whatnot. They were not, so goes the argument, aware of themselves as an indigenous people. Hence, they were frequently either adopted by the indigenous people by which they have connections, or they were included or assimilated by the so-called white predominant settler society. So it's kind of a, a bivalent logic, right? Either white, either indigenous, or the term Miti only appears in specific circumstances leading to the exact sociological conditions that would mimic those two first categories. I don't know if you get me, right? So three, three part point. The argument goes that outside of this, and the term soup kitchen has been used by Dr. Anderson to, to, to point to all these disenfranchised Aboriginal people that are looking for a legal shot at the government or anything, these guys are in fact hijacking the terms MIT that they never used before in order to, uh, to, do, to advance their cause and their politics. So that is, in a nutshell, the arguments, okay? I would have to do like a 45 minutes on this alone to do justice to his book, but in a nutshell, I think we have a good primer, okay? So now I want to challenge that break by break, or at least tree break, right? First one, right? On the early descriptions of so-called Akkadian Miti, yes, the word Miti was used out east. I'm sorry to say so, but we'll have to come to terms with that. Now, you can put a sociological spin on it to say that it didn't mean the same thing out west. I will reply, this is fine. <laughs> you can spin it the way you want, and it can be different in the Great Lake than in the Red River, than in northern, Saskatch you know, northern Saskatchewan, in the Northwestern Territories, or whatnot. I don't mind it, a different spin. I'm just suggesting here that no one should have the exclusive spin on that word. Right? So here are you know, pictures. I don't know if my Prezi presentation will allow that. Yay, right? This is a representation of homme acadien. Depicted in, wow, right? <laughs> Depicted in the 17th century, OK? So you can see some of those feature of that homme acadien, especially also the dark tone, the skin, that one can say. And also the, you know, the, the one could say historically the half-savage kind of costume, right? So here's the reference for, for future uh, conversation. Here's a woman Acadien, and here's another depiction. So I just wanted to bring you guys like some sense of the picture. Sorry for that, it's going to disappear in a right? This is a femme Acadien with the pipe, smoking tobacco, right? And less, arguably less, you know, uh, showing some signs, but nevertheless really interesting in their feature. So femme acadien and homme acadien were already kind of displaying Indians' way in their way of dressing and abilitying themselves. Now, I'm not just going to go with pictures for you to trust me on this. We're going to go to historical evidence that suggested so, right? So I got a few square down there just for us to have fun. The common quote in knowledge, the one that you can find on Google. You know that, right? I quote the people, this is a description of the Akkadian. The people are tall and well proportionate. Good on you guys. <coughs> Their delight much in wearing long hair, such as, you know, many First Nations, arguably. They are, are of a dark complexion in general and somewhat of the mixture of Indians. But they are, but they are some of the light complexions, right? So you get like a mishmash of different complexions. They retain the language and customs of their neighbors, the French, with a mixed affectation of the native Indians. And of course, I'm going to stop it there, right? So you can see the blending of two cultures. You can see for external observer that looks at this and reports this in, uh, this is Charles Morris, by the way, very famous, right? 
He's, he's, he's seeing the Akkadian. He's like, whoa, this is a weird bunch right here, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply two of those categories, and I'm going to try to understand what they're all about a bit. But these are, you know, th this is a cheap shot, right? You can go and Google and you say, Sebastian, you, did you really do your homework in terms of going on Google? And, and, well, I, I did a little bit better, hopefully. A great number of mulattoes, some Akkadians distinctive by virtue of the Indian blood. This is a portion of this book here from Jane Aney, The History of Acadia, 1879, that shows in text that they're described as mulattoes, which means, you know, had any Indian blood in them, and they were fearing the scalp proclamation. So at this point, like, you know, rain was going down on the Mi'kmaq communities and under indigenous communities of this island by the British, and the Mi'kmaq, and the, uh, sorry, the Acadian, arguably Métis, were intermarrying with them so much often in different places of Acadia that they were like, man, we're going to taste it as well. So they made a, a special mention of that in the literature. But that tells you again that the appearances, and not only the appearances, but the treatment, the way in which people treat you due to your physical differences is important, right? So community identification. I'm going to go further in this because at this point you can say, look, Sebastian, this is nice and pretty, but these guys are just mixed individuals. They have like social consequences because of such. But where is the collective element that Dr. Chris Anderson and others would ask me? Where is the sense of community that really makes an indigenous people an indigenous people? Because let's make no mistake, folks, these days communities serve as a fold to police Aboriginal people, right? The first question that people ask you is, what's your community? And they assess you according to your communities all the time, right? The problem with that is that sometimes, not in all cases, but it leads to strong essentializing tendency, right? You should be looking and in line with your community or else you're going to get in trouble, right? So we are always constantly looking for that external validation by our communitarian aspect. But I wanted to abide by it, so I've looked at a couple quotes that may satisfy our appetite for that. A body of Métis from La Hève in Acadia. Now, let me state for the record that I'm not, as of yet, an expert in Acadia. I have a huge interest in Acadia. My ancestor, Malette, married Joseph de la Berge. And Joseph Laberge is connected to Pitt. Pitt is connected to Melançon, to Robichaud, to Thériault, to Goudreau, to... Hence, I am connected with the beautiful Acadian family and proud of it for the record. But I'm not an expert yet, and with your help, perhaps I will become. This is just out of an interest with people denying the existence of Métis in the East that I was like, I, I, I have something to say about this, right? I can do further, but look. That's not really complicated. This is from Justus des, uh, des Brise, History of Lunenburg, 1895. Anyone heard of that evidence before? So Justus here is saying in the quote here, states that there was also a body of Mi'kmaq from Chibuktu and Miti from La Hève, right? A body of Miti, right, from La Hève under one Lejeune Zibriard Courier des Bois. So we have a description of a body of Métis right at the heart of Acadia using the term Métis in 1895. So why can we suggest, how can we suggest that the term Métis was not used in the literature that were describing people as such? Not convinced. Okay, let me just get to, to that one. This is a French one. The term bois brûlé is used by Rameau in 1888, suggesting that la plupart de ses membres, in French, I quote, aient été dès l'origine se fondre avec les bois brûlés, which means le bois brûlé is a very specific term also used out west in the Song of Le Grenouillère when they won their, their first battle in 1816, if I remember correctly. So they say in that little quote, Rameau there suggests that la hève again is a headquarter of the Bois Brûlé. So he described the Acadian Métis as Bois Brûlé, and furthermore, he specifically pointed to that La Hève region again as a quarter, like as a, as a general quarter of those Bois Brûlés. 
So you have a sense of, like I would suggest, a sense of community that could be argued from such quotes, right? Especially if you pile them all over together, right? So these, uh, um, one last quote here. The word people was even used. People, in this quote that I've translated for you, and I quote, a colonial institution in emergence where once lives out later a small people, a new French province beyond the ocean. Several of his companions had indeed formed it with Indian squaws. I'm sorry for the term. Irregular household giving the rise to Miti family. The term Miti family is used. The description of a small people is used. All this historically in 1889. So all these evidence are just there to, you know, brush the water a bit in terms of the term not being used in the Eastern culture. As per these historical evidence, the word Miti was used to describe the Akkadian, or at least some branch of the Akkadian people, arguably, not to suggest that all Akkadians will self-identify as Miti. That's not what I'm suggesting. But it certainly suggests that the term was in use from an historical perspective, which links to your point. Here's a letter from Monsieur de Lavarenne to a friend at La Rochelle, 1756. I've quoted in yellow in here, and I'm going to make bigger for you. They were a mixed breed, and I quote, that is to say most of them proceeded from marriage or concubinage of the savage woman with the first settlers, who were of various nations, but chiefly French and other were English, Scotch, Swiss, and Dutch, the end of quote. This is a statement of people discussing what did happen to the Akkadian following in line with the deportation, right? Like this quote here say, ask your question, and I quote, sir, about the English being in the right or wrong in their treatment of the Akkadians or descendant of the European first settled in Acadia, right? This is the, the intro of that letter, that portion of that letter. And then the author said, let me tell you what the Akkadian are. And this is the descriptive of the Akkadian, a mixed breed. The term mulatto is coming in. The term miti is used. Bois brûlé is used, historically speaking. Now, my argument to you is that all those terms, that is, I will show you, is linked to shame later on, right? That is linked to the need to hide that you had any Indian or miti or whatnot ancestry due to some form of some consciousness of impurity. All these were already there in the historical records, okay? So that, in my opinion, have most likely shaped the way in which people understand themselves. How can you say that 200 years ago people were described as Métis and never impacted people here in Nova Scotia and different places in, in this highland? This is a stretch, right? Uh, by the way, because I'm presenting these kinds of evidence, I've been also called an archivistic Métis as an insult. <laughs> oh, we're tired of Sebastian. He's just an archivistic meat. He's got, he's got no culture, nothing. He's just all like these old quotes from old leaders and dusty things, right? When frustration gets to a boil. I mean, I'm proud of those quotes. I've searched them hard and I've shared with them with many community members, by the way. But uh, I mean, it doesn't please anybody, right? So there's even a distinctive lifestyle here. I'm going to go a little bit quicker. But distinctive lifestyle linked with fuel trade right here, as per your suggestion earlier, right? Fuel trade, right here I founded the evidence of fuel trade of like Akkadian described as Métis or rough, you know, the term Métis as we are now, we can stop arguing about this. It was used historically, right? So if it was used historically, I would suggest you have a right to claim that word per its historical usage in Acadia, perhaps in a specific way to you guys. As, I, as I'm aware, there's a KMT representative in the room. <clears throat> Not to say that it's Red River. But wait, wait. Miti Mitchif was never used east. So goes the argument. I'm sorry to say, but the term Miti appeared in 1760 in that record right here in Bagazier report that it goes into Gaspé, Pabot, and he said that there are 17 familles, Normand et Mechif. The term Mechif, even Mechif is used. This constitutes 100 people, by the way. It's not like, oh, 17 family. Well, no, it's 100, 100 people together, right? Surveyed as Mechif. 
Now, I know that the argument will say, well, these people were identified by outsider as Michif, but did they truly understand themselves as Métis? I'm going to do a lot of soul searching to go 200 years ago and tell you, did you really, on affidavit, can you prove me that you were talking about yourself in terms of a Métis? Now, that's a harsh claim to make. And I dare a lot of people out west where I get a lot of friends to go in their own ancestry and look for those affidavits. I mean, they're rare, right? Okay, you can go for script. But half-breed script, by the way, they were not exclusive to people from Red River. So-called half-breed travel all across the land, including, we have gathering evidence of that, including some Landry and some familiar name, that travel out west in order to get a fair shot at this and had a script. So they were not like, are you from Red River half-breed? Yeah, then, the, you know. As long as you were prior to a certain date in Manitoba, you were good to go as an half-breed, right? So even that is disputable. So some people will say, look, Sebastian, all what you're doing right now is really wrong because you're racializing, you know, race. Like you're putting a race type of argument forward. You're just spinning it again. I would argue that those early description of race and mixed race and whatnot, we're more in line with an understanding of like, uh, that you can see in Montaigne, for example, writing, right? Or Montesquieu, when he describes people according to their, their mœurs in French, their way of life, their culture, their, the climate that shapes their behaviors. What race at that time was like the French race or the English race. It was not purely biological. It was always meant to mean something more than biology. This argument that you are either culture or biology, this is more recent in history, I would argue, right? Prior to that, those distinctions were kind of blending in together a little more, right? So that is just a technical point. So I'm just going to move along here. But wait, we are told no can do. Miti were either assimilated in Mi'kmaq or Akkadians. There is no third category here what I call the colonial law of excluded middle. But I have evidence here in journals, and look at those. I like to call them babies. Here are evidence from 1886 of community of Miti of Paspispiak, right now used in a, in, a, in, a, in a trial, in trial court. Okay? So this exemplified that there's a bunch of people called Akkadian Miti, or the Miti of Paspispiak, and they are rioting because they are starving. In 1888, mind you those dates, it's after Louis Riel, right? We're deep into the maritime and Quebec side of things. And these people, people are described as a community, and they are described as having leaders. Chiefs. Okay? And not only that, look, the words are there. The Miti of Paspispiak. I'm not inventing this, my friends. You know? The Miti of Paspispiak. And you know why they are so called the Miti of Paspispiak? Because the people of Quebec called for a repression of the Acadian Miti again. And they said, you should send the military and kick their ass. But make no mistake, the French are good, the Anglos are good, and the Mi'kmaq, well, you know, be nice a bit. But the Miti Akkadian, these are the ones that you need to elbow down, right? So in those papers, they're making kind of all the distinctive feature that Dr. Chris Anderson is arguably looking for. What's the date? 1888. Right? If you're not satisfied, and this I'm going to go quickly, here in Laminerve, there is distinctive, right? The distinctive aspect of the Acadia Miti are even described in newspaper. And I quote, Les Français et les Anglais ne prendront possiblement pas part à cette agitation, which means the French and the English won't take part to this, right? La difficulté, the problems are raised by the Métis, which are the descendants of Acadiens and Mi'kmaq. I don't know. To me, it's pretty, it's pretty telling, right? You have communities, describe it as mixed ancestry of Acadien and Mi'kmaq, with leaders, which show social cohesion, doing an action of starving together and fighting for their lives. It's pretty telling, right? Especially 
And these are all other articles because there were, you know, six different articles speaking of this. Six. Métis fishermen, rings a bell. Métis fishermen, back in the days, also described as Métis fishermen. Lurking around, looking for another riot, those shady Métis, Acadian eh, fishermen. <laughs> okay? I mean, hey, nothing changed, right? So, that's 1888. Right? La Minerve. So, all these evidence are now used in, in court by the descendant of the Métis Acadian people now, right now in Quebec, in the Gaspé Coast, okay? Because these guys are in court right now, fighting for their rights, where some out west disregard them altogether, right? So I find that harsh sometimes, I won't. But going back to Dr. Anderson's argument, I'm just going to put a few lines for you here. A, B, C, right? As a scholar, we got bad habits like that. Don't you think that naming out a group like that in a newspaper in Quebec with six different articles won't affect the sentiment of themselves? Won't affect the treatment of others to themselves? Don't you think that these types of literature don't shape the perspective of people that are pointed out? And do you really want to say, hey, you got to find me some writing. These people that live in the bush and in the boat and fishermen and are struggling to survive, they must have written evidence that they say, I am a Métis, I understand myself as a Métis, and I will be forever a Métis in all my years. There, now I can go back fishing and my descendant will be all right. Arguably, this is not the way it worked, right? Most of these people didn't have access to books and pens and all that. They were, you know, fishing, hunting, trap line. So I'm suggesting that this pressure to argue for evidence and discarding the oral evidence, because let me be clear about that. When I said to those people that I'm having a discussion with, I said, guys, man, at first I was trying to be nice with no evidence, none of that heavy stuff, right? I said, guys, man, we're, we're, we're second cousins sometimes. Our communities in the Middle West, half is Red River, the other half is not, right? We're blending. We have our old traditions with the Acadian. We have the oral tradition with other communities across this land, with other First Nations. We're very connected to different networks. No, you don't. You don't have our old tradition. You're fooling yourself. You're an opportunist. Say, what? Yeah, yeah, you, you, don't, you don't know what you're talking about. No, it's because of that Constitution thing in 1982 and 1983 that you're not calling yourself a meeting in order to pick some rights, and you're, you're scavenging on the identity of another person. I was like, really? We have our old tradition. No, you don't. Bring me uh, evidence, Sebastian. This what the, this what that, that's what I was told, point blank. So I did. Well, I've started to, and now I'm called an archivistic Métis. And so I'm, I'm just waiting for the next, next problem to come up in order to, to serve it right. So why am I too long right now? Am I, are, where are we doing no, on time? I want to leave some time for questions. All right, so. Okay, I'm just going to try to go there, and after that question and answer, perhaps we can play and dance a bit, okay? Why policing the term Miti anyway? Why? Why? And I'm just going to try to conclude with that before serving my legalistic kind of trust at this. Why should we police the Miti argument when 30 different ethnonyms were used in Red River alone? Why this big fuss about, like, Miti is a word for us? When back in the days in Red River, that was not the case. The word Métis was not just that exclusive thing, right? And here I got a quote for you if you don't believe me, because people don't believe me nowadays. They don't. They just don't. This is a quote from 1879, the French half-breed of the Northwest, that describes them. I quote, the designation of French, French, is often indifferentially applied to Canadians, Métis of all grades, and even pure Indian who associate with the Métis and speak their patois. It should also be stated that in Manitoba and other places, as, you know, a certain proportion of mixed blood from English and Scottish father bearing the name as Grand, Grey, Sutherland, and whatnot, are classified as French. So even the Anglos are classified as French. Everybody there is a French, and that's not a good thing, let me tell you, sometimes being a French, I mean, you're going to get in trouble just as you are an Acadian, right? Those dirty French, shady French, half braid French, what not French, right? So this is just to tell you that 
there were no homogeneity in terms of the name. Nobody was like, oh, I am a Miti and only a Miti. I'm carrying the flag. Like, what is this? This is, this is a new mythology. Now, Paul is seeing out east and out west, now south and out north by the different types of scholars that are going everywhere and say, you don't have a right to claim that. I'm, like, I'm, I'm flipping the table on these guys. On which basis are you claiming that, historically speaking? Because where I'm from, that's pretty different, right? Second, when some Miti from out west themselves refuse the homogenizing terms of Red River Miti. And I have a quote here. This is from RCAP, a Miti from northern Saskatchewan, if I remember correctly. I, for one, and I quote him, I've always stated that that's not who we are saying the Red River Miti. We are saying the Miti of Western Canada. I come from northern Saskatchewan. I'm not part of the Red River. I don't subscribe to the label of Red River, and so on. So you see that even out west, there's a broad diversity of Métis identity. So why should we kind of narrow it down to that homogenizing, nationalistically spin that wants to homogenize it all? That's a good question that I would like to cast forward for another day. And finally, my plot of resistance, when Riel himself acknowledged the existence of Eastern Métis in 1885. Don't believe me? Well, go in his writing. This is Riel. When it comes to the eastern province of Canada, many Métis lives there persecuted under the attire of Indian, Indian costume. Their village are village of indigents. Their Indian title to the soil, get that, is however as good as the Indian title of the Métis of Manitoba. Riel here is make the explicit distinction between the Métis of Manitoba, the Métis of the eastern province of Canada. He understands what Métis are, arguably, right? He wrote a bunch of stuff on that. And he says that their right to the soil is equivalent to the Miti of Manitoba. And Riel, furthermore, in his writing, said, we have to value our identity as mixed heritage. He goes into his writing suggesting we are as proud as being French as we are of being of Indian parentage. It's the fact that we honor both together that bring the distinctive aspect of our people in all its definition. It's the cultural valuation of this. It's not a bad thing. It's the cultural valuation of this, which is at the heart of the Miti experience, I would suggest, that makes me going to your house and saying, I value my dual, triple ancestry or whatnot in the constitution of my Miti identity. And you will say to me, so am I. And we're going to relate to different historical process and experience and hard time and good time and all that. And we're going to share fish over it. And we're going to bond. And Riel had this project of unifying all Métis across Northern America. All half-breed, preferring the term Métis. Because he said in one of his quote, Now that the grade of blood has mixed to such a level and such a different degree, that it's no more important of saying half this and half that. It suffice to have one drop of each bucket and to proudly call yourself a Métis. Now, if Riel himself said those things, on top of all of the other things that I've, you know, shared with you today, I'm asking why? Why are we pursuing this hard road of, like, trying to snatch away the possibility for other people to have their interpretation based on their history, based on historical records, based on their oral tradition, Blessed by Riel himself in the aspects of sharing that future and that political possibility. Now I'm asking this why. And I'm out for asking and I'm out for answers. So basically this was a bit of my spin. And these evidence are, you know, to me very important to gather into suggesting that the court should go for a liberal interpretation of Paolet. Okay? Because if all of this is true, and I didn't have the time, but it's also linked to a process of shaming in terms of the Acadian Métis, then the case should be brought perhaps before the court, if some of you are getting there, right? That all of that treatment, that 200 years attempt to suppress the different communities, to blend them, to force them, to assimilate them, this argument alone should drive the liberality of a Pauli test. A Pauli test, mind you, that were applied to the Pauli family that descend from Wisconsin. Not connected to Red River. And not necessarily only connected to Sault Ste. Marie, but nomadic people. I'll leave it at that, folks. I hope it was a good teaser for further discussion.
and hopefully we can discuss some of that later. As I said, I have many more evidence in banks that we can discuss and see your opinions about it. Thank you so much.